So um, we're going to talk about how you start your composites today. And part of this, I'm going to show you this. This is a, a project I did in my first year of college. So this was a long time ago. In fact, this was 1993. Uh, that would be spring of 94, actually. So that was my first year of college, my first Photoshop class, official Photoshop class. And also the year where a friend of mine walked up to me and said, have you heard about the, the internet? And I went, the what? <laughs> there was one computer lab at RIT that could get on the internet that spring. Um, and so we did a project based on what you thought of the internet. And even then, I had this, you know, I had this thought of the internet as being this massive kind of world where you could zoom places and so on and so forth. So this was my project on the internet <clears throat> and what I felt about it. Um, now, all meaning aside, it's a very simple composite um, created from these two pieces. So here I've got this background, and here I've got this photograph of a friend of mine that I took in the apartments outside, or right out of uh, RIT, on campus, but right outside the, uh, the class area there. Um, and uh, I made a number of mistakes doing this because I had never done it before. So I'm, I choose to use this as an illustration for how you start your composites because it's a difficult photograph to eliminate the background on. Um, so for instance, some of the mistakes that I made, I would have been much better off if I had had him all the way in the grass. The reason for this being because his suit, his pants, his suspenders are very close in color to the background, which is going to cause me headaches in a minute, as you will see. Um, I would have these days brought a blue screen background, a portable blue screen background, and honestly taken the five minutes and set it up so that he could have sat against the blue screen. That uh, would have saved me a lot of time. Um, I would have been very careful about my lighting and made sure that I didn't have shadows quite as harsh as they are here. I would have included what we call a fill card, which is a little white piece of paper, basically, well, a big white piece of paper that bounces some light back in there to fill in those shadows. Um, because as you can see, I can't tell where the chair ends and the shadow begins, right? So there's all sorts of mistakes that I made in this, but they can be mistakes that you guys can learn a lot from. So that's why I continue to use this as an example 20 years later. We won't talk about that. Um, and uh, almost 20 years later. And hopefully, you know, as you see my mistakes, you'll, rec you'll recognize some things that you can do uh, to eliminate uh, said mistakes and make life as easy as possible for you, which is a good thing, right? Okay. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, that being said, our real goal is to take this picture here of Space Boy, as I've named him, um, <clears throat> and put it in this picture. Now, a lot of people, when they're starting their composites, will just take this picture, copy, and paste it directly into the background. I don't want you to do that. I want you to make a new file first that you're going to call composite. The reason why this is important is because I don't want you to in any way, shape, or form alter your source photographs. I want you to keep them. And I want you to keep them unspoiled and completely untouched so that you can go back to them if you need to. Because it's one thing to have to redo your project all over again. It's another thing to have to find all your photographs all over again. Because truth be told, you won't be able to find all of them all over again. And it just won't, it won't happen. So I want you to save them all and I want you to keep them untouched. So what we're going to do is we're going to make a new file. You can name it composite right now. 8 by 10, 300 pixels per inch. <clears throat> Transparent background, all sorts of good stuff. Click OK. Now what we're going to do is we're going to start combining our images. So first is I'm going to grab my cyberspace photograph. Now, the way I like to do it is just really simple. You can select all and then copy and then paste. I just like to tear, tear it away, okay, bring it down, and then take that layer and just drag it right there. Boom. And it just drops it right in. The other nice thing about this is it'll resize it to fit the resolution. So if it's the correct resolution, it'll be the correct size in here. Now, because this is a little longer and longer, I have a little extra that I can work on as far as the edges are concerned, but that, that looks pretty good. And now, this image, I'm going to close it. I don't need it anymore. I'm not going to do anything to it. You see? I don't want to touch it. 
I want to keep it in its raw form so that if I accidentally screw up this version here, I can go back to it. If you copy and paste your pictures into your background photograph and then find out you messed it up, you might have to go searching for that background photograph again and there is a possibility, a good possibility, say 50-50 chance that you don't find it again. So I don't want you to do that. I want you to just keep everything, place everything into a new file, okay? So now we're going to go back to Space Boy here. I'm going to do the same thing, tear him out, and then drop him right in. <clears throat> and it resizes him. Notice I dropped him in before I started to get rid of the background. I want you to keep everything. You don't know when you might need pieces of the background. Okay? Or one of the things that I've been noticing is some people have gotten a little ahead of me here, even though I told them not to, <clears throat> and they've just been using the eraser tool. I don't think that's a good idea for you. You don't, I haven't taught you what I'm about to teach you now. And using the eraser tool is very dangerous because once you save that file and quit Photoshop, all your undos are gone. And now if you find out that you messed up, again, you've ruined your original. Right? Now, if you mess it up, you got to go find it again on the internet or wherever. And again, that could be very difficult. So now that we've dropped him in there, I'm going to close. Now all I should have is my source files. And I've got this as the previous version I already made. Let's close that just for sake of simplicity. <clears throat> so now I'm going to go to full screen mode so I can kind of see a little better here. And we're going to go about getting rid of our background. That's our first job. Now, <clears throat> there are several ways to do this, and they all kind of have to do with these tools right here. Um, <clears throat> the first one I'm going to show you is actually the magic wand tool. This is the old school one. This is the one that I used to use 20 years ago. It's a great one, but it has its limitations. So I'm going to show you what it does and how it works and why you probably won't use it. But every once in a while you can. The magic wand tool <coughs> simply said, selects pixels that are the same color as the one you click on. So I'm going to go in here. If I click up in the background here, you can see how it selects all of these pixels that are in the building. <clears throat> now, before I go any further, let me define what a selection is. A selection is what it sounds like. It's a selected group of pixels. It shows you what you've selected by giving you these marching lines, these little marching ants, right? Almost looks like ants running around, OK? <clears throat> Selections can be very powerful. For instance, if I were to grab a paintbrush and just grab black paint and start painting away here, notice nothing happens unless I go inside the selection. So it acts almost like a stencil, if that makes sense. Okay? We're going to use it for uh, a purpose very similar to that. You'll also notice, can you see them, that there's a bunch of holes here. That's another very typical th problem with the magic wand tool, is it gives you a lot of little holes. And those can become very annoying. Because if I were to hit the delete key right now, you can see how against the blue background, you can see pieces of the siding of that apartment building are still there. It's very frustrating. <clears throat> The other thing that's very interesting is when you're going to the magic wand tools, it has a tolerance setting. See this? That tolerance setting allows it to select more or less pixels depending upon how alike they are to the color you've clicked on. So if I take that tolerance and I set it back to 32, which is actually where it normally is, and um, try clicking again, you'll notice that a lot of those holes have now gone away. And the reason being is because now the magic wand has a tolerance, a little bit more tolerance, for pixels of a slightly different color. However, notice what's going to happen when I click, let's say, on the, the wood chips landscaping here. Okay, if I click in here, notice how it gets all of his tie. Okay, um, if I click on his suspenders, Notice how it also gets into all this stuff, okay? I mean, so again, I, like I said, I made the mistake when I photographed this, this picture. 
His suit is way too much like his background for this to be really easy. Now, since you guys aren't photographing your own pictures, you very likely may in encounter photographs like this that you want to use. The magic wand tool pretty much only works really well when you're dealing with solid colors. So, if you've got something like this, a situation like this, probably not the best thing. The other thing that can help, sometimes you need to just change your tack. If I'm looking at the background and the background's really complicated, maybe instead of trying to select the background, I should be trying to select him which goes really well when I hit the shirt because the white is very different from the brown of the background. But as I showed you before, when I go and hit the suspenders, it gets all this background in there. If you want to continue clicking, you can try to add more. You can just hold the shift key down and it will add to the selection. <clears throat> but this gets really tiring after a while and you can oftentimes leave yourself these little holes without knowing it, okay? So all that to say, the magic wand tool is a great tool, but it's old, it's outdated, and it doesn't really deal very well with um, complicated objects. <clears throat> so let's get rid of this selection and start with a different tool. In that same toolbox, for lack of a better word, button, <clears throat> is the quick selection tool. The quick selection tool is going to work 99% of the time for you where the magic wand is going to fail. However, the quick selection tool is not going to work for me completely here, as I'm going to show you. In this case, I'm going to start selecting him. He's a little more simple than the background, so if I can get the selection around him, I think it's going to work better. So first, I'll just start. Now, the cool thing about the quick selection tool is it learns from you. So you'll notice right now that the quick selection tool has a plus in the middle. If I hold an option key down, well, okay, wait. So then I make a selection. If I then hold an option key down, it gets the minus. That means I can subtract from the selection. So watch what happens when I get to some of the trickier portions of this um, thing here. <clears throat> so I'm going to click, and I click and drag. And it learns and it looks for the edges of an object. And if it goes too far, which it hasn't done yet, that's how good this thing is, Okay, like here, see how it got the window? I'm going to hold the Option key down, and I'm going to subtract it. And then what it does is it kind of looks for the edges again. And see, it went a little too far, so I'm going to click in here and click in here and just kind of go back and forth. And the, cool is really, the, the tool is really cool. The cool is really cool. <laughs> the, the tool is really cool because it does. It learns from you. And as you subtract and plus, it goes, okay, well, I went too far this time. I need to back off a little bit. Where's the next edge that I can find that's in between those two points? It's really smart. It's really uh, very cool. So I'm just going to keep going here, and you can see how it's going to start working and, and doing a really pretty good job. And I just click and drag, so I'm holding the button down almost the entire time. And then again, when I get into places where it's not what I want, I may um, use the minus key to subtract a little bit here, plus key to bring a little bit back in. You can also change sizes, just like any other brush, to help you out. Spacebar will give you the hand symbol so you can move around in the image without having to worry about losing your selection. So that's really key. Okay, keep going here. So now there just kind of totally lopped out that middle part. This is going to be a fight here for me to get this. But you can see as I keep going, and again, maybe get a smaller brush, I'm going to, it's going to keep learning from me. and keep changing the selection. So it's really, it's really a great tool. Um, so let me just keep on going down here. Now's where it's going to start failing. Okay, so I've gotten here. When I click, and there's two things that I can do here, and I'll, I'll show you both. Um, when I click out in here, obviously not much is going to happen. Well, actually a lot's going to happen. It's going to select this whole shadow. I don't want the whole shadow, but the problem is mine, not the computer's. The shadow and the back of the chair are the same tone. It doesn't know where to stop. To be honest with you, I can zoom in there. I don't know where the edge of the chair is. What's my solution going to be? What do you think? Yes, thank you. 
Perfect. I'm going to guess. I'm going to fake it. I don't know exactly where the edge of the chair is. But nobody's going to know where the edge of the chair is. So as long as it looks right, it doesn't matter if I actually get the edge of the chair or not. All that matters is that it has to look correct. We're going to end up with the same thing down here along, along his feet. The heels of his shoes, you can't, you don't, I can't see where the heel stops and the shadow begins. So I'm going to have to make it up. Okay, <clears throat> so let's keep going. Again, that's my fault, not Photoshop's. So now I'm going to try and go in here. And this is where this tool fails me every time. Look at that. These tones are just too similar. Um, and, and there's really not much that I can do. It's, it's going to select everything every time. So I have a couple of options. Um, I'm going to go to a smaller tool here, and I'm going to try and go down the leg. Nope, nope, still doesn't want to. No, nope, undo it. So I'm stuck. <clears throat> now there's one more tool that I'm going to show you today that is going to actually get around this. But I'm just going to pretend that I didn't want to go to that tool. And I'm actually going to make the selection, and I'm going to show you how I could correct it. Some of you have been using the eraser tool. I said that earlier. Okay? You're going to see right now why that's a bad idea. Because you don't have to do that. Down at the bottom of your layers palette here, whoops, go away, is this little button. And if I hover my mouse over it, it says Add Layer Mask. When I click this button and I have a selection running, something really cool happens. Watch. Boom. Oh, look at that. Now, if you look at the layer up in the menu here, in the layer palette, you'll notice that it's now added this. That's your layer mask. And it's actually showing you what the layer mask is. Now, let's, we're going to option click into the layer mask so you can see what it really is. Boom. See his outline there? The layer mask is actually black and white. It's a black and white layer. And where there's black, the layer becomes transparent. Where it's white, the layer becomes opaque. Okay, so let me say that again. Where there's black, the layer is transparent. Where it's white, the layer is opaque. Now, if you paint in gray, or you put in gray, then the layer becomes semi-transparent. You can modify this mask with the paintbrush tools, which is really awesome when you think about it. So I'm going to click back out of that again. Now, when you're going to go modify a mask, the important thing that you notice is that you are selected on the mask. See how there's little four lines around the corners here? got to make sure you've selected the mask, not the layer itself. If I select the layer itself, and I start painting black, I'm actually painting black on my layer, which is not a good thing, OK? So see, not a good idea. However, if I click on the mask, and I start painting, it makes him see-through. <coughs> now, you'll notice that the opacity of my brush is set to 72%. If I take this down even more, and I paint in black on the mask, you can see how it kind of goes see-through. Okay, I'm not painting in blue. You're actually seeing the layer underneath. You can see the clouds coming in here. If I move him, you can see all those other things in the background. <coughs> So this is really good to know. And you have to be very careful. When you start painting masks, you always want to make sure that your brush tools are set to a, an opacity of 100%, at least to begin with, and that you've got full black and white down here in the, in the colors palette. Just click on those, and then put black to the front usually is what you want to do. And now I can get rid of things. So if I just start painting the black right over the shadow here, I can get rid of that. The other thing to be very careful of is the hardness of the shadow. You usually want it up at 100%. Okay. So what I can do here is, there's, my, there's the back leg. 
So I can just basically try and make it look natural. I didn't do a really great job there. But a little bit more work, and I don't, I don't want to spend a ton of time on it. Okay. A little bit more work, and you'll have a really good selection. Now, right now, he looks like the guy in Jurassic Park with the Tyrannosaurus Rex went after him. Okay, He doesn't have legs. We're going to get those back by flipping our white to our primary color. And then watch, as I paint white onto the mask, they come back. Now this is extremely advantageous. This means that you will never lose the information on that layer. If you use the eraser tool, conversely, okay, and let's say by accident you chopped off an ear or a piece of the ear, okay, and you didn't notice it, and then you go and save, the bell rings, you leave, you come back tomorrow and you go, oh crap, what happened to his ear? Guess what? You're stuck with it. If you use the eraser tool, that data is gone. If you use my method, these layer masks, all the data is still there. All you got to do is go to the white brush and you can get that ear back. Yeah, question. You, you could, yeah, you could do that. Well, you'd have to be careful. You have to go around the edges, you know. But yeah, you don't even have to use the, tool, the, the selection tools. You can just paint. You can just add a layer mask that's empty and start painting into it. I think using the selection tools is better because it gives you at least a start. It saves you time. <clears throat> now, let me show you how I would have done all this. So, I'm going to trash my layer mask now and show you how I would have done this. Now, when you trash a layer mask, it says, do you want to apply the mask? If you hit apply, it's going to delete all the information. So he won't have his legs anymore. Okay, so we do not want to apply it. We want to delete the mask. And we get all of our stuff back. Okay, so you never apply the layer mask. Never. Not unless you absolutely have to, which I don't know why you would, but I'm sure there's reasons. Now, I'm going to show you one more tool. Up here are the lasso tools. Lasso, polyagonal lasso tool, and the magnetic lasso tool. The lasso tool is kind of cool, really badly named in my opinion, <coughs> um, because what it does is it allows you just to draw a selection like that. Woohoo! You know, okay? But the magnetic lasso tool does something really cool, and that is it snaps to edges. A lot like the smart select tool or the quick mask, or wait, what is this called? The quick select tool, quick selection tool? A lot like the quick selection tool does. So let me show you how this works. I'm going to zoom in here. I'm going to start on the knuckle of his hand. We're going to go around. You start by clicking once. And then it's actually going to look for edges. Now it's going to look for edges that are where your cursor is. So you have to be pretty on the edge here. You don't have you don't want to go out here because then it starts freaking out. Okay? See? I can hit the delete key to get rid of things. So let's try this again. So now <coughs> You can also click to select or to set points whenever you want to. But you see how it's doing that? I mean, it's really, it's really following the edge of the shirt really nicely. And I'm not clicking to make those points. It's doing those points on its own. Now, when I get here, I use the space bar to get the hand. Because if I go off of the tool, if I go over to the toolbar to change tools, it deletes everything. So you don't want to do that. Once I get into the suspenders, you're going to see it's going to kind of go a little haywire because the suspenders are actually a lot like, see, the color of the background. So it's going to try and snap to the white. So here I just have to be real careful and just do my own clicks. And then I can, and again, if it fouls up a little bit, I can, I can fix that with the mask later on. So it's going to really mess up a little bit here around the ear because we got all these trees and edges and it's kind of freaking out, doesn't know what's going on. So get my space bar to get my hand. And then I don't even know where his hair is and versus the tree in the background. I mean, I really messed this up as a photographer. 
But I had never done anything digitally before. I didn't know what to look for, and I never had learned this stuff before. I had to learn on my own. Honestly, my professors didn't even really have a lot of experience with this stuff. So we were figuring it out on our own. The professors were giving us the assignments, and we were just doing them, um, <clears throat> which is great. It's a great way to learn. So there it freaked out over the ear. We'll get rid of that later. <clears throat> I don't want this to take too much time. But you can kind of see how it's, it's, it's working. Now here along the, the tie, it may freak out a little bit too, partially because the tie is a little bit blurrier than everything else because it was moving. It's not the sharpest photograph in the world anyway, and I'm not quite sure why. The scanner didn't do a great job back then, I don't know. 20 year old technology. <clears throat> yeah, see there it took out a big chunk of the tie. But that's okay, I'll fix that later with my mask. Man, it's really messing up here. There we go. So I'm doing a lot of clicks on my own. Now once I get to the shirt here, I don't have to do anything. It'll do its own thing. Spacebar, move, okay, there we go, keep going. See, now I'm not clicking a thing. <clears throat> now there it's screwed up. If it screws up, you just hit the delete key and it deletes the previous point and you can just keep going. So now, once we get around here, you can see it's working out pretty well. Now, a lot of times you don't need to use this tool. This tool is a little bit more intensive than, um, <clears throat> oh, you know what I forgot to do? I forgot to set the back of this. So if I go here, I want to set the back of the, um, of, the, of the chair, right? So now I can just click and go out into nothing and, and it will actually just allow me to draw a line, which is pretty cool. Now it might not be straight like right there. It bubbled out, but that's okay. I can solve that later. No. There. There. See now back here again. Now here, that quick selection tool did not do very well, but here the magnetic lasso tool is doing just fine. So there are places where each w tool will actually work better, and you just kind of get a you just kind of get some experience with them, and you'll understand, you know, which ones work better. But usually the quick selection tool is going to work 99.9% .9 of the time for everybody. So now again here, I don't know where the foot ends, so I'm just going to kind of make a bogus heel and then again I can fix it later on. So go out here to the edge. Now we're going to deal with the edge of the foot later too because I've got a big problem there. I chopped off his foot didn't I? Let's just finish this and then I'll show you guys that. Now here on the outside edge of the pants I'm having more problems because the ground is so close in color. So it really looks for that edge definition between you know contrast between two colors and here I didn't give it much. So all these headaches that I'm having making the selection, that's my own fault. And you want to be on the lookout for images that don't have a lot of similar colors in the background versus the foreground if you're trying to get rid of the uh, foreground or background to keep a foreground element. You know, save yourself a lot of headaches if you're just careful. Again, I'm just kind of fudging the heels here and I'll fix it more later. I don't want this to take too long either, so. Ah. There. Almost there. So we're gonna go up the leg here, up the knee. I missed those folds, but that's all right, we'll get them back later. And again, because the masking is such a flexible solution, I can go back and fix almost anything that's not perfect. And now, now comes a real important thing. <clears throat> As I'm about to be finished, you notice that, see that little circle that comes up next to the, to the magnetic lasso tool icon? See that come in there? That means I'm about to close my selection. And by closing my selection, it's going to then create the little marching ant lines. Boom. See? I had to click on that and then there we go. Now I've got a much better selection than I had before. 
Didn't take me all that much more time to create than it did with the quick selection tool, but it's going to take me a lot less time to modify it. So now I just go and hit my create mask. Boom. Looks pretty good. Again, I, you know, I definitely have some edges to take care of. But let's put him into place first. <clears throat> so I'm going to grab my move tool. I can move him around, um, <clears throat> do all sorts of things. So I've got this problem with the foot, though. What do you guys think is some good solutions that I could deal with with the foot? I mean, there's a couple. So let's brainstorm really quickly. I've got this foot that's chopped off because I wasn't being a good photographer. Yeah, one solution. OK, I can put it off the screen, which is actually what I did. What else could I do? Excellent. Yeah, I can take the toe of the left one, copy and paste it, and put it over on the right. Absolutely. These shoes are also really dark black. There's very little detail. So honestly, I could just take a black brush, and with a good steady hand, I could paint one in, too, pretty easily, OK? Because there's not a lot of detail there. I've got a lot of options. What I chose to do was the simplest. Um, <clears throat> I moved him down to the bottom of the page. I rotated him a little bit here so it looked like he was flying through. Whoops, that's the scale again. So that it looked like he was flying through space. Okay. <clears throat> and then I blurred the edges. I blurred his edges a little bit too. Um, <clears throat> put his head strategically in between these. Okay, I think he was up here a little bit more, but that's okay. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that you want to do whenever you do a selection is you got to really zoom in and look for these telltale lines that are around the edges. You got to get rid of these things. So here I'm going to click, make sure I'm clicked on my mask. I'm going to go to my brush tool. Let's get a slightly smaller brush, but I'm also going to change the hardness of the brush down a little bit so that I've got a little bit of an edge. And here's where I'm going to take my opacity down a touch, get my black color back, and then I can just go right up against the edge here and soften that edge. And what I'm doing, I'm not erasing, I'm painting in my mask, I'm painting black in, <clears throat> but what it's doing is it's softening that edge, especially around the hair here on the back edge. If I soften this, he'll look pretty normal. Okay. If I start softening things over here too much on this side, it won't look right. Why do you think that is? I mean, I can soften a little bit, but I have to be very careful. Why do you think that is? No, because he's moving, and he's moving from right to left. And so if things are a little softer and out of focus on the right side, we'll accept that. But if things are too soft on the other side, we won't. So you have to be, you know, I have to understand that idea of motion, too, can play into it. <clears throat> Notice gaps in the hair. OK, see that? I'd be really careful, those gaps in the hair here. So again, I'm going to take low opacity, and I'm going to kind of <clears throat> soften them out so that we can see this, the sky right through them. Now, because of the background of this picture, some of these spots could honestly be tree. We don't know. But the truth of the matter is, does it matter? We can't see the tree now. All that matters is, does it look like hair? OK, that's really all that matters. And hair is tough. You've got to really take hair and, and really work on it with low opacities. Um, because remember, we can kind of see through hair because it's so thin. It's an optical illusion. We really can't see through it. It's just so thin that we, we don't see it always in sharp focus. So if I'm a little bit blurry on the hair, that actually can look better. Too, then, if it's sharp. But then when you get to something like the edge of his shirt, that you don't want to use a real soft brush on. You want to really come around and take that and make it sharper, sharper edge, and usually use a little higher opacity. And the great thing is if you mess it up, right, OK? Oops, I screwed up. Just take your white back, flip your white back in there, take the opacity all the way back up, and you can just paint it right back in. And that's the beauty of the layer mask, and that's really the major key. All the tools that I taught you are really great today. 
you can play with them, you learn how to use them. But the layer masks, that's the key, because layer masks give you infinite possibilities. You'll never mess up to the point where you absolutely have to trash your image and start all over again, because all the data is there. As long as you keep the data there, you'll be fine. If you try a different method, like using the eraser, and then you chop off an ear, or you mess up, and then you forget about it, or you don't notice it until tomorrow, I'm just going to tell you you have to start all over again. So use these layer masks, because they're really, really important. Any other questions about layer masks and the selection tools that, we, that I've showed you? There are a lot more selection tools, too, but those are just the three main ones that I want you to know for now. Okay, that, that's it.